It's the Autosport Podcast. We talk to Indianapolis 500 legend Rick Mears about the challenges of this unique race. Welcome to Indianapolis Motor Speedway for a special edition of the Autosport podcast. My name is Ed Straw, the editor-in-chief of Autosport. Obviously, there's a huge amount of interest in the race in Europe with Fernando Alonso taking on the challenge. Obviously, it, it is... Well, I was going to say one of the greatest races in the world, but frankly, it's the greatest race in the world. Let's not uh, let's not make a debate of that. Uh, I've got two guests who are very, very well placed to... Uh, to talk us round Indy, to tell us about the challenges, to talk about this year's race. We'll get the uh, we'll get the dull one out of the way first. David Melcher, Autosports Indy car correspondent, motorsport.com uh, American editor. David, obviously you're a regular here at Indy. What are you making a, of this year? There seems to be a little bit of added buzz, even for Indy, with Alonso here. Absolutely. Yeah, already it's a fabulous amount of attention on just one driver. And I know there there have been rumblings among some of the uh, other drivers, some of the lesser lights, that uh, too much attention is going on him. But, you know, the smart ones will take that as their advantage. You know, the focus won't be so much on, on them and they'll sneak up and try and beat uh, Fernando. But uh, the fact is, Alonso's doing a wonderful job. He. Yeah, I thought today would be the the trickiest day that he's had so far, but in the 90 minutes of running we got in before the wet, he dealt with a very, very trimmed out car. I think he was like third or fifth fastest without a toe. And I think that was the final thing he really needed to prepare for before the, uh, uh, before the, you know, holy hell of Monday and everyone out there at the same time trying to get more traffic running under, under their belt. So yeah, he's he's been he's done everything right and nothing wrong from what I can see so far. Yeah, very much so. And we've also got someone who I guess is at the opposite end of the experience spectrum to Fernando Alonso. We made a little short list of people we wanted as a guest on this podcast, and it's safe to say we've got our number one choice. Right. A man who really needs no introduction, Rick Mears. Four Thank times you. Indy five hundred winner, six times pole sitter here. What he doesn't know about this place isn't worth knowing. <laughs> I suspect he's forgotten more than the rest of us could ever hope to know I've about this forgotten place. Forgotten about everything, I think <laughs> these days. <laughs> well, we'll test you on that there you uh, go. <laughs> during this during this podcast. Well, Rick, obviously you've been coming here forever. You know the challenge of winning here better than anyone else. So I guess let's just start with Alonso. What have you made of of this uh, of this rookie, a super rookie? I guess we you, you might call him. Oh yeah, no, he's doing a great job. He really he's a racer. End of story. You know, he, he's a racer. He's obviously got, you know, a ton of talent, you know, to be able to accomplish what he's already accomplished uh, in Formula One. So, you know, I, there was no doubt in my mind that he'd run well. And uh, this place is just really, and, and they've been doing a good job with him on it, is, is seat time. And there's no substitute for seat time around here. Um, you know, people can talk to you until they're blue in the face, but until you get out there and, and physically do it and go through it, it's hard to really put together uh, in your mind until you feel it yourself, you know. So, uh, you know, they've kept him, you know, buttoned down pretty good, getting him a lot of laps. Um, uh, you know, as soon as the first laps I saw him run, I knew, you know, you could tell he's a racer. I mean, he, he had a natural pickup of the line where it needs to be or, you know, where he wants to run um, right in the ballpark to start with. So, there's no doubt in my mind he's he's going to run well. I mean the learning curve the learning curve is going to be in the race. He's been getting a lot of practice in traffic, uh, which is a good thing. Um, but you can practice till doomsday. You're going to learn more in the race than you learn in six months of practice, because you end up getting put into situations that you would never get into in practice, no matter what you do. So that's going to be the learning curve, and how he deals with those will be the thing. But but he's He's a smart racer. He'll deal with them, I'm sure. And uh, it's it just the, the main thing is not get caught out on something. You know, the the closing rate here can be so quick at times uh, when something somebody checks up in front of you or whatever. Um, I, even in practice, I I saw it. You know, kind of sneak up on him a little bit, but he was ahead of it. You know, he caught it. But it, I'm sure the next time that same scenario would happen, there'd be a bigger gap. You know, because of what he learned from that one. So you know, that's the kind of thing. It's a you know. He's, he's going to do well. He's going to do well, I think. And it does seem to me 
watching from my vantage point that like like he's taking this challenge properly seriously. I guess over the sure. years you've seen all sorts of drivers come in here, people with big reputations from elsewhere. Some of them will respect the place as it should be respected. Mm-hmm. Some of them, I guess, will not really get how difficult it is. But it seems Alonso understands just how difficult this is and the level of opposition he's up against as well. Well, that's exactly part of what I said. You can tell he's a racer, you know, because to me, a, a true racer knows that everything's different, knows that you're not, you know, you're in somebody else's backyard, knows it's something you haven't dealt with. And it, that's not brain surgery to figure out, you know, and then, uh, it's a whole different element, a different group. Uh, there are no doubt going to be things to learn, you know, and, and, and like I said, he's a racer. He knows that. So, uh, and over the years, you know, other dr- drivers that have come in, you can tell that some it's like, okay, you go out there and run a few laps. Well, it's one thing to run f- some laps around here at speed. It's, it's, you know, it's not all that difficult to do. It's getting the last two or three percent that's the hard part. And, uh, you know, when you come to really, when you, when you really start trimming the thing out for qualifying and, and, and depending you know, if I've got a, if I've got a very good car and, and we maybe have an advantage over most of the field or whatever, then I don't have to hold my breath quite as much and still be quick enough. But if you aren't, you know, if you're, the package you have isn't quite as good as some of the others, Okay, now you got to figure out how you're going to carry that thing that last bit to to be competitive, and and that's where the real difficulty begins. Um, that are your teammates, you know, that have the same equipment you do, and that's that's always your yardstick. So, you know, you got a teammate that's running very fast, and he's he's got all the same stuff you do. Okay, right back in the old days when we had the pop off valves, you know, if your teammate had the same equipment you did, but he had a pop off valve that was an inch stronger in boost. Okay, now what do I do? You know, now I've got to figure a way of making up for that. And those are the times that are really tough, you know, to to get it out on the right rear more, hold your breath a little bit longer, get it up on its tiptoes rather than being down in the track and try to make up that difference. That's the hard part. And, um, you know, but that I think they're in a they're in a good they're in a good spot where they're at with the package they have and the teammates he has, the team he's with. So I think they can keep a little conservative set up on the car to allow him to help, you know, to learn at a, at a better pace. And, uh, and he's smart enough to know that too. So, uh, no, I think he's in, he's in a good spot to do, to run well. And I think it's great that he's here, you know, and, and you said some, some of the grumblings and to me, I know in one of the press conferences we had this morning and, uh, Penske was saying the same thing that, you know, this sport is all of us, us as far as competitors, we want to beat, the best you know we want to compete against the best and uh whether it's american european whatever you know it doesn't me as a driver it never mattered you know it seems to make more difference outside the the industry than 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 inside but uh so to have him here i think is just a plus across the board for all of us and just talking more about how you master this place i guess david rick mears what made him so good around indy to my mind, he is the uh, ultimate guy who is way ahead of his car in terms of uh, an- anticipation, being able to think him driving at 99% with a 1%, uh, you know, s- you know, set aside for thinking at 225 miles an hour. Uh, his 99% was greater than his rival's uh, 100%. And to my mind, you know, I always thought of him as like uh, America's Alain Prost in just being able to be so much uh, smarter than his rivals, not letting his uh, emotions uh, take over when he uh, stepped in the cockpit. I mean, he's admitted to me a couple of times when he's gotten mad, but he still channeled that anger into doing something positive uh, and uh, usually ending up winning the race. 29 wins, 40 pulls, those kind of stats are... you know, massively impressive in a time when there was nothing like the reliability that we have now in uh, IndyCar. So, right, I'm not going to just sit here and blow smoke up his ass. So. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask well, you. thank Rick, you. I appreciate that. I mean, Rick, do you recognize that description? Is, is that, <laughs> do you think that's well? I don't want to put you in a position where you have to be immodest. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, to a point, but then, but I, I usually remind him, I say, yeah, you know, that's, that's all great, but, you know, it all boils down to I was always lazy. 
you know. <laughs> and, and I knew the harder I worked on the car, the less I had to. So, <laughs> so I worked on the car very hard so the car could do the work and not me. And uh, that was always the, the, the drive. But uh, no, it, it's one thing, you know, my, I think my natural driving style was more suited for this place than, than others. And, or any of the speedways, so to speak. And it seemed like the faster the track, the, the higher speed the corner, the more naturally it came to me for my style of driving. Um, as the tracks got slower, corners got slower or tighter, I had to learn more. I had to work at it more. When we got down to a street circuit, I had to learn how to drive a street circuit because it was, it's more of a, you have to get a lot more animated in the car, a lot more movement, physical movement. And, and I'm, I've always been a field driver not a reflex driver. Uh, cars talk to you. You know, they tell you what they want. All you have to do is listen. And uh, some guys struggle with listening to a car, and, and I I don't have any tr problem listening to a car because I want that car to talk to me all it can. And because uh, all I want to do is what the car wants because if you start doing what the car doesn't want, that, that's when you get in trouble. So, you know, speedways, it, to me it's more of a fingertip driving than a hand driving you know then then you know a tight grip on the wheel and yanking the thing around um there's no room for error on a speedway and you have to learn to work this is where the the car talking to you comes in you have to learn to work off the the feel the car gives you just before it does something not wait until it does something to catch it slower corners you can wait until it jumps sideways and you catch it and dirt track the thing a little and go on you know these places, if it gets out like that, it's and you weren't already starting to catch it before it went, it's usually too late. You can recover them once in a while, and you do a little of that in qualifying at times, but uh, only if you have to. Um, but it just seemed to suit my, you know, it, that type of driving. I think lends itself more to being able to trim the car out, and. Uh, if you're erratic, if you're, you're quick movements, um, you know, kind of tend to yank the car around a little bit, you always have to keep X amount of load in the car and footprint on the ground to keep, you from, keep it from getting away from you. And, uh, you know, the more you trim that thing out and the more you get it up on its tiptoes, it's almost like you can't turn the car. You've got to roll into the corner very smoothly, very gently, and hope you get that initial part right because there's no room for correction from that point on and get it to come out at the other end where you want it without a lot of correction because correction will just magnify any problem you have. So that fingertip, it's almost like, a, I guess, one example I've used before is, is it's like, it's like driving in the gray, up in the gray, up in the marbles. If somebody gets, you know, somebody forces you out of the groove and up into the gray, it's, it's oh, man, you can, you hold your breath and you, you're afraid to move anything. You, you don't, you can't move the wheel. You don't want to move the throttle. You can't touch the brake. You can't, because any, any little input you do is going to be a big problem. Well, that's qualifying. It's that same type of thing, you know, up on your tiptoes and, and you're on that limit that if I make any any movement hardly at all, it's going to upset it, you know. And to me, that's that's getting the thing trimmed out where you're getting the most out of it. And, uh, I mean, I've said that before that, it, you know, if it wasn't up on its tiptoes and, and forcing me to hold my breath, I felt like I left some on the table. But that's only for qualifying. Now, in the race, I want to get it locked down a little bit tighter, you know, and a little more comfortable. And, you know, I can handle holding my breath for four laps, but I can't hold it for 500 miles. And... And um, because the mindset completely changes at that point and you go into a checkered flag mode. If I don't see that checkered flag, nothing else happens. So that's number one priority. And first half to get to the second half, second half, if you aren't already there, start working your way to where you need to be. And it's just kind of the general, you know, the general plan on. And I really went with kind of that general plan on most all races, not just it's just you, tor you, you shorten up your time frame. You know, on a sprint race, shorter race compared to a long race. It annoyed me earlier in the press conference where someone called you the Oval Meister. Now, I, it's not that I disagree with that, but there's a lot more to Rick than that. One of his first wins was at Brands Hatch uh, in 1978, and uh, which was a kind of like a bastardized version of uh, Brands Hatch. It should have done the full circuit, frankly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> yeah, it's it's the, the Indy Circuit is called fun. now. The, yeah, the yeah it is called the Indy Circuit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
And then, you know, the really cool thing about Rick is in 81, as CART, uh, who were the organizing body for IndyCar uh, at that time, as they started bringing in road courses, it started really counting against some of the guys that had only ever grown up on ovals, be it dirt or pavement. And uh, in 81, Rick won all three uh, road courses that year, Riverside, Mexico, and uh, I'd have to look at the other one, uh, oh, Watkins Glen, of course. Yeah. Um, so it's not like the guy didn't have uh, skills in the road course set at all. And he was always learning fast, and you're up against someone who, well, sorry, you're teamed with him, but he was very, uh, Bobby Unser was very, very quick mm-hmm. on uh, road course. Well, he's quick everywhere because he was so goddamn determined, but. You know, I think in you're on. In the first year, it was with Mario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, true that. Yeah, Mario was doing a part time schedule while he uh, was winning the Formula One World Championship. So, yeah, Rick was uh, very good on uh, right hand corners as well. Should we uh, deal with the uh, San Air situation? Uh, in case you're unaware, Rick Mears uh, had a huge shunt during practice for the 1984 uh, San Air. Uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a little oval uh, in uh, Canada and kind of mashed his uh, ankles. I think that's the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the way to describe it without actually going into horrible medical detail. Uh, mash, uh, mashed sounds pretty horrible. Well, let's though, just say it? there they were going to take them both off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Initially, they were going to take both feet off. So they wouldn't yeah. have anything to do with them. And fortunately, Pinsky says, well, time out. Let's try something else. Yes. Uh, I think it was Dr. Terry Trammell yes. that saved your feet. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, thereafter, Rick had a bit of an issue playing your, it was your right right foot, wasn't it? You well, discovered both. you had a turbo lag on your own foot. Yeah, the, yeah. The, I, I, <laughs> I realized one night that, that I the response in my right foot wasn't as quick as it should be. You know, I, I, I hadn't really thought about it. It always seemed to move what I wanted, but... But I actually started testing a little bit. I just I couldn't do that that slap, you know, the real quick. So I'm everything, you know, I've I've got to keep that in mind. I mean, I'd already been driving on road courses and everything when I really realized that, and so I just treated it like turbo lag. You know, you just okay if I wanted to come on over here, I just got to start a little sooner, you know. And um, but it really, you know, that it it there was a couple of things went on there with the sand air thing and the feet that that kind of created that. That um, that I really had a problem with my feet after the accident, um, you know. I mean, I, if somebody said which one do you want, I loved both of them. I mean, I I enjoyed any track I ever got on. I, I like them all, and that's what I liked about our series is we got to do everything. That's why I didn't do Formula One. One of the reasons when I had the opportunity. That's why I didn't do NASCAR when I had some opportunities. It, it's because I enjoyed driving. And we got to do it all in our series, and and that's what I enjoyed about. It. But now, if somebody says, "Which one do you want to race on?" If, you, if they're going to give me a choice, I would take an oval, not necessarily because I liked them more so than a road course, but because it suited my natural style better, and I figured I had a better shot at it, you know, on an oval. But the whole thing with the San Air and dealing the feet, it was timing-wise the accident. You know, and, and obviously the, the next year when I started running again, I passed on all the road courses because my feet were too fragile for the, the braking and everything. One of the fortunate things that had happened uh, a year or two before that accident, I'd already thrown the clutch away. And I don't know that anybody else had yet at that point. And uh, I quit using the clutch because we were getting into the road races more. And, you know, back then the brakes weren't near as good. And, and you know, we were struggling with brakes on road courses. And you'd get down to the end of the day, the end of the race. Okay, now it's showtime. You know, now it's now you got to go, and uh, you'd be ready for the shootout at the end. And that's when the brake pedal was long, and they were going to the floor, and and it, it was so hard to heel and toe. You know, you you dive into a corner, try to get them real deep, jump to the brake pedal real hard, and the thing go down so far that your heel would take the throttle with it. You know, so it, it, I thought that's just too many opportunities for mistakes at that time so i thought why can't i do away with a clutch just start working on the timing on the revs and the stuff and get the dog rings to click and and um so i had already started doing that i'd been running for a year or so without the clutch when that when the accident happened so fortunately it wasn't a big transition because i i mean i couldn't heal until now 
And um, so that that part didn't really bother me. But where the, the I think kind of part of the stigma, so to speak, that it, that that I was struggling on road courses because of my feet was it was a timing thing with the PC 15 and 16. We were struggling with the the, the new chassis, and uh, and plus I was I was teamed with one of the quickest road racers when things were right that you could deal with, and that was Sullivan. You know, he could run very quick when things were in place. And um, so we still had to develop our car. But, you know, we still need to keep the sponsors happy and, and try to win races too. So we got into a mode to where, you know, on the road courses, which was kind of Sullivan's best shot, he'd run the march, and I'd run, I'd continue development with a 15 or 16. And then vice versa, we'd split it on the oval. So that made my over, oval performance look much stronger than my road course performance. So everybody just took that as a sign as my feet were the problem. And, and it really wasn't that, that, that much of a problem. So there was a lot of things that, that did that. When we finally ended up getting the, the next Penske chassis that worked, the first road, and a street course of all, of all things for me, which was my toughest, uh, first street course we went to, Long Beach, I think we had a quick time in the first practice session. And the first thing everybody said, what are you doing different? You know, I said, nothing. I got a car that will stop when I want to stop, turn when I want to turn, you know, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of things laid on the feet that, that I didn't feel, you know, uh, were as much of a problem as people thought. And uh, for all those that think that uh, Rick Mears is just a nice guy and uh, hasn't really got ice in his veins like a lot of race car drivers, I just want to point out that when he came back, he did just five races that year, and uh, on his third one back after the shunt, he took pole at Michigan, and the race after that at Pocono, he took pole and victory. But the coolest thing of all is that in 86, you'd think that his uh, Indy 500 pole position that year would be his greatest pole, but no, the track that very nearly tried mm-hmm. to cause him to lose his feet, San Air in 86, he got pole there. So... He's uh, not a man uh, easily intimidated, and I think anyone that watches uh, the closing laps of the 1991 Indy 500, which you can find on YouTube, will also see that Michael Andretti quickly found out that Rick Mears isn't easily intimidated either. <laughs> and of course, that was the, the astonishing pass late yes. on around the outside of Turn 1. Well, that was a fun I don't think one. anyone was expecting you to go around that side. That was a fun one. Outside's always the most fun if you can make it work. <laughs> yeah. if you can't you <laughs> yeah that, then it becomes the least fun <laughs> yeah no that that was fun but that that particular race so the you know the the feet have come into play off and on over the years and uh, that particular race what a lot of people didn't realize is you know we'd had the crash in practice uh that year and was that the first time you'd ever hit the wall at Indy? yes Yep. It's astonishing. <laughs> yeah, if I if I could have made it through the last two years, we'd have run our whole career without ever touching anything here, and that yeah. that, that, that would have been fun. That would have been a nice yeah. little feather in the hat. But but that crash wasn't your fault, right? No, no. The right rear, we had some problems with the pins, uh, the pins on the wheels and the, the hub, and they weren't lined up, and and actually the right rear came loose and came off. And uh, just as I turned in, I felt the thing. The thing shudder shook a little bit and stepped out on me. I thought, "Uh oh!" By the time I thought, "Uh oh," the right rear exploded and, and it was backwards and into the fence. But uh, and is that ninety one? Yeah. Yeah. And then you came out and uh, took pole position anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was the day before qualifying. We we, we came back and got in the car and uh, we came back from the hospital. And what nobody knew is I'd fractured the bones in my right foot again. And uh, from the accident, and so we got back from the hospital. We didn't, we didn't tell anybody, but uh, got back from the hospital and we got into the garage. And Roger said, "What do you think about getting a backup car?" I said, "Let's try it." So I, I climbed in the car, and I couldn't push the throttle down. It just felt like somebody sticking a knife in my foot. And so I said, "You know, I, like this, I it would be hard, but if we can if we can lighten up the throttle springs enough, you know, to where I can push the throttle down, I'd like to go out and run it." So they basically ended up taking all the throttle return springs off of it to get it light enough for me to be able to push down. And so we fired the thing up, and this was a real testament to the team, you know, the the equipment and the work those guys do is we went out in the backup car, and I went out and got up to speed, and, and I felt the car was really, you know, really good, really where it needed to be 
I could tell the thing was, was going to work. But every time I moved my foot, it would just kill me. So I thought, i got to get this over with. So I knew the thing would make it flat. So I just went and put it on the floor and left it there and ran a lap. And it was the quickest lap we run all month. We came back in the pit and parked the car and got out. and said, okay, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> but but later, the race was, was the part I was getting at before I, I sidetracked myself all the time these days. No, I, I, I no, did no. it on Noah. Sorry. That, uh, no, 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 you didn't. Um, we the race started. You know, now we had a week to you know or so to heal up and a couple of weeks, whatever it was. So I thought everything was fine. We get in the car and start the race, and about ten laps into the race, my right foot just starts killing me. And, and again, it's just like somebody sticking a knife in the side of it. And so I'm twisting my leg and I'm turning my ankle and I'm moving all over the place in the car trying to figure out where I can, how I can work the throttle and it not hurt. But every time I put pressure on it, it, it just killed me. So I kept playing around, playing around. Pretty soon I found out, I thought, I'm going to try this. I stuck my left foot on top of my right foot, and I pushed my pushed the throttle down on top of my toe of my right foot and used my left foot to push the throttle down. And I found out that I could pull in, I could pull back with my right leg and take the pressure off the side of my foot. I thought, man, this will work, you know. Got rid of the pain. So I thought, we'll just do it this way. And uh, so I, I drove that whole race with my left foot on top of my right foot for the throttle movement. Now, obviously, when it came to the shootout at the end with, with Michael, I said, okay, none of this. You know, we went back to that at that point, the adrenaline. But, it, but it, that goes along with the game plan. It's, it's, you know, for the race, you do whatever you do to stay in touch. You don't have to run qualifying laps every lap of the race. And we did what we did and worked with the car, got the car where it needed to be and drove with my left foot and all that. But then when it came to the shootout at the end, now it's time to go. And then I went back to normal, you know, throttle and, and, and brake position and and because uh, I didn't want anything that in a, in a reflex situation it would be wrong. So. so we ended up driving the last 10 or 12 laps normally. And obviously those those late stages of the races, this is of, of the Indy 500, this is something that Fernando Alonso, if he makes it that far, will be experiencing for the first time. I mean, how long does it take to get on top of that? Because I'm thinking about, obviously, uh, you defeated Andretti that year but then we look back earlier the famous uh, 82 finish uh, with Gordon Johncock almost caught him after having the having too much fuel at the final stop I think it was 0.16 of a second at the end and people were saying oh actually if you'd been a tiny bit more aggressive you'd have got past him and I think uh, yeah, I saw an in interview earlier in. uh, exactly, I saw an, uh, an interview with Johncock where he said that Rick Mears three years later would have won that and made the decision correctly so that shows that even as an established Indy 500 winner, the decision making was. But I also wanted to ask you if you thought that was fair, because I, I'm not entirely sure from watching the footage if it is. No, uh, you know they, they got that all wrong, <laughs> as far as I was concerned. I'd have made, you know, if that happened today, I'd make that same move at the time I did, knowing what I knew then. All things being equal and all things the same, I'd have done the exact same thing ten years later. And, and, you know, because I remember AJ saying he was one of the ones that made the comment after race. Oh, if I had been Mears, third place would have won that race because I'd have stayed there, you know, and, and crashed with, with John Cuck. Well, Foyt didn't win four races by making moves like that. He mm. wouldn't have done it either. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's smarter than that. But, uh, and, I, and I'm not saying that derogatory. That's AJ. You know, he, he, he's, he's a character. But, um, what it boiled down to is I'd been around I'd been around Gordon several times throughout the day, and and any time we got together I could get by him and, and and go, and so you know at the end of the race there, first of all when we came out of the pit I didn't think I was going to be able to catch him so we just put our head down and said, let's just do what all well, we they, can do and see what happens. They've given you too much gas, right? That and 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 I, I caught a car coming in pit lane which added. I, bend, if, bend if your we, wing, right? Yeah. 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 If we hadn't, if we hadn't, if that hadn't happened, we'd had enough time to to get John Cock. But the when the car was following into the pit, he, he decided to stop in the fast lane and then turn into his pit instead of getting over. And so I locked it up and slid up, slid up and, and pumped him. And that added that added probably two, three, four, five seconds, which would have been four or five more laps to work on John Cock. So. Whatever with the fuel, if that hadn't happened, we'd have still had plenty of time. But the fuel is what, kind of what made the difference at the end as far as in my mind as the decisions I made. 
And, you know, so we just put our head down, and, and I saw we started reeling him in and started reeling him in, and I'm looking at the splits and the times and, and the laps to go and everything, and I th started thinking, yeah, this could happen, you know. We, we might be able to get him. So we just kept our head down and kept going and finally, you know, reeled him in. Okay, knowing what I know now, yes, I would have done it different. But in that scenario that I had and what I knew, I wouldn't change a thing. So I catch John Cog with with um, a lap to go, and I you know caught him going into three basically, and the timing was good to be able to set him up to get the run off of four, for the white flag. So my thought was, well, why wait, you know? And uh, the timing was working out, so I just went ahead and went for it and got the run at him coming off of four, jumped in the draft, pulled out and went and pulled out and. All day long that I'd done that before, we just motored on by. This time I pulled out and stopped. And he just, he reversed the momentum and started back by me. And I thought, where did that come from, you know? And which what it was is I was carrying a load of fuel and he was light. And that reversed the, the speed momentum. So now I'm already there. I'm already beside him. And, and we go down to the corner and I wait as long as I can. And I, I get to the corner and... and this is not rocket science either for me to figure out. You know, I, I get down there and I, I say, okay, I got two choices. I can stay here and we can crash or I can get my nose out and have three more corners to try to get him back because I know he's gone to the grass because he's been, I've been chasing him, watching him, and he, he was fighting a big understeer in the car. He was having to go to the grass to make a turn. And it's Indy. He is not going to lift. And he's half a car ahead of me. So, you know. He's coming down. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So let's see. Let's, let, let, me, let me think about this a minute. Should I stay here? Nah, I don't think so. That's going to be a crash. So I decided to pull my nose out, let him go, and, and, and then have three more corners to work on him. So when I let him go, then I had to fall back across you know, his wake in the air, and which lost the front end, and, and you can't turn the car as you go across the wake or it spins you on the other side. So I had to straighten it up and drive toward the fence until I got out into clean air. By the time you do that, you're up in the gray and you're having to pedal the thing. And that allowed him just to get enough distance on me that I couldn't quite get back to him at start finish. So under that same scenario, I would make the exact same decision, even today. Yeah. It's only hindsight that has, you know, yeah. Yeah, hindsight, you know. Yeah. Yeah, hindsight, hindsight, knowing that, you know, if I, let's say, let's say I had a, one more lap to re, redo it. I'd have waited till the last lap because I had him basically at the start finish the first time, and then he reversed the momentum. So hindsight knowing that, I'd have waited if I had known that. I'd have waited till the last lap, get the same drive off of four, and get the nose ahead of him by the start finish, and then it, it wouldn't have mattered at the other end. That's really the only thing I could have done any different. I think one of the most generous things you said after that is that if anyone was going to win it, though, it was going to be Gordy. Because yeah. of how he had won the 73 one in just yeah. traumatic circumstances with his teammate, you know, lying dying in hospital and the race ending in Wagnerian conditions with the black clouds. And I think, yeah, there had been a marshal killed in pit lane. It was mm -hmm. just one of those races that he never got to celebrate. And he had also had a near miss in 77, actually. I think it was yeah. Gordon yeah, that he, handed he, the he fourth in the creek, win. When he jumped in the creek down here when he got out of the car and turned Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. I that mean, was my first year here. I watched it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, yeah, if anyone was going to finally get a celebration, uh, get a chance to celebrate, it was, uh, yeah, uh, that, it was good to celebrate. It was great. And, and actually, that thought, like we talked about, that thought had crossed my mind earlier in the day. Uh, and like I said, we'd run around each other several times throughout the day. And, and I remember, you know, when I was running with him, you know, I, that very thought, you know, that he was, he was racy and, and he was strong. And I remember thinking, you know, if we can't, you know, if I can't or one of our teammates can't, I, I was hoping he would just because of all that had happened. Yeah. He'd never really got to celebrate the win, you know. So, uh, and, and Gordy and I had always gotten along really well. And so I was actually, if, if anybody had to do it other than us, I was tickled to death it was him. That does kind of illustrate the point, the story of 82, of how all these tiny margins, these tiny differences mm -hmm. are what those last laps are all about. And it's... It's just experience and judgment and situations yeah. outside of your control. It's often said this is a race that 
that kind of lets you win, that, that chooses you to win as well yeah. as you winning it. And obviously the driver can play a big part or you, you wouldn't have won it. But lady, <laughs> so, luck, so lady luck's got to be helping but, you out too. The, there's no doubt about it. And that's uh, my first win here in 79, uh, similar deal. And, you know, we're running well and, and I come off of turn two and, and a car was coming out of the pit and I had a big run on him. And just about time I'm closing in on him, the, the right wheel, rear wheel comes off and rolls right across the front of me. And, it's, and I've got a big run, and there's no time to really do anything. And so a split-second difference, one way or the other, would have taken the corner off the car. And our day would have been done instead of ending up winning the thing. You know, So you, you've got to have some lady luck on your side. You, you know, the old saying, you make your own luck, is true to a point. But you, you, you still got to have some lady luck on your side, too. But, you know, that's where, you know, Fernando, he's going to, I think he's he's going to be able to do his job, I think. And and I, and I think as long as he, you know, keeps his nose clean and and um, he's definitely got the ability, um, you know, if they get in and get some good clean stops for him and keep him, you know, in track position where he needs to be and everything else. And, and uh, you know, and he has some lady luck too, I think he'll do well. Talking of Alonso, one of the challenges he faces getting used to using a spotter. Obviously, you know a little bit about that. This is mm-hmm. your uh, your uh, your post racing retirement job. <laughs> That's yeah. probably doing it down. Obviously, as <laughs> tell everyone that uh, Rick has remained with Penske for all this time. I think you're an advisor is your official title, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, what, it's whatever. <laughs> yeah. he, but yes, Rick uh, also spots for uh, Helio. And uh, it's somewhat ironic because Rick himself never had a spotter. Um, <laughs> as uh, Helio's spotter, Rick will be uh, attempting to help Helio score his fourth Indy 500 championship and basically join uh, Rick, uh, AJ Foyt, and uh, Al Unser Sr. Uh, in a very, very exclusive club. Personally, if I was Rick, I'd deliberately say something that made sure that Helio <laughs> didn't, just to make sure... He how how do we know he hasn't been? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, all I these just, years. I've been up there spotting like crazy. I never say a word. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, fortunately, cause I, I'm kind of... I'm, I'm a little old school in that department. And some of these kids today, when I... We're, we've been helping out over over the last few years here and some of the new kids with any lights cars and go out and run them around the track or whatever and talk about this is you know coming out of the pit just a standard rule of thumb coming out of the pit i'd never go all the way to the wall going into three i'd always leave a car width because it's very easy to come out as you're getting up to speed and you're crossing across the track it's very easy to keep somebody right that has a run at you coming off of four or two you keep them right in your blind spot and uh, so, it's, to me, it was just, I'm not up to speed. This is not a qualifying lap. I don't need to go clear to the wall and, and, and roll the dice that one time that, that I don't need to. So, I'd say that to them, but then I'd say, but today, you know, it's not as necessary. It's not bad to do anyway, but it's not necessary because you have spotters today. And uh, I said, I never have had a spotter. And those, those the kids today, they about flip when I tell them that. <laughs> you know, oh, my God, how did you do that, you know? Well, I, I've never been 100% on the spotter bandwagon myself anyway. Because if I'm doing my job, I don't need a spotter. That's the way I look at it. And I usually try to sell these the, the young kids because a lot of times they get misled. Uh, some of these spotters today, they... they they create their space, you know, a little bit, and and uh, not not all of them, believe me. And and don't get me wrong, spotters are a good thing, and and especially for what they initially came out to do, and that's for safety. And and I'm in total agreement with that. Um, but as far as as a driver using a spotter, the spotter for me should be a, a an, an absolute backup just in case I miss something. Because if I'm doing my job, I already know I'm clear. I already know I can move. And I try to sell these kids to get them to think. Because I've seen, I've seen kids get in trouble today because of spotters. Because they rely too much on them. And, uh, and, and the only way you can, you can get them to really stop and think about it today is if you can sell them on the performance gain. Then they, then they perk up and listen if, if it's going to be a plus, you know, performance-wise. And, uh, and and that's why I tell them, I said, you know, I spot, 
for LAO, and I'm not going to clear him unless I know he's clear. And sometimes at different angles and different tracks, you know, he's probably clear by five, eight, ten feet by the time I clear him. He could already be in there. And sometimes when gaps are closing up, you need to be able to make a split-second move now. And if you wait on me to clear you, you may miss the opportunity. Or if you know where you're at, you should know what's going on all around you at all times anyway. Now, granted, we miss things. You know, I've missed them as a driver. And there's times I've done things that had I had a spotter, it would have helped me. Um, but I always worked on not doing that and making sure it didn't happen. So, you know, and, and Elio's, he's more, he's a little more old school also. He doesn't need a lot of input. But there are times, you know, when it has happened. I've, I've, I've you know, these these last split second moves, and it can work out timing wise to where a guy's kind of seesawing back and forth behind you, and and get you out of sync to where you're glancing in one mirror, and then you glance to the other, and about the time he's going the opposite direction, and all of a sudden he's beside you before you can get a chance to even look back. And it's not like cup cars where things happen so much more slowly. You know, these things are, are so much quicker. So, and there's been times that, that I'd yell inside, inside, and I'd see him flinch in the car. I'd see the car twitch, you know. I go, whoo, you know. You know, he, it was one of those times where he, he just happened to glance the other way, and the car was going the opposite. And afterward, he'd say, man, I'm glad you called that one. That saved me. So there's times that it, that it helps out. But, but do, do I need somebody as a driver yakking in my ear after I've lost the car and I'm sliding <laughs> sideways? I've got my eyes shut, my ears shut, my head down, my arms pulled in, just waiting for the next hit. And he's saying, hold the brake, hold the brake, you know, turn it and do that. Yeah. Leave me alone. You know, I, I, I don't – and I, 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 I can't do two things at once very easily. And, and uh, you know, listening to somebody, a mayor all the time, and I'd have trouble with it. It, it would take a lot of getting used to for me. Now, he can kind of make his call on that if, he, if, it, if it's – a problem. It's like, you know, with Elio, I, I just, I've got it worked out with him where I know when there, something may be changing that might be, you know, that he's not aware of before it gets to a point, you know, and I'll give him a heads up that, you know, if somebody's back and all of a sudden they start closing on him, you know, you know he was clear by 15, you know, a couple laps ago. Now all of a sudden he's clear by eight, you know, I'll give him that heads up to let him know the gap's coming down. And, and he, then he will get more aware and into the mirrors more himself to keep track of it. So it's just kind of a heads up. And, and Alonzo can set that up however he wants with the guys, you know, whatever is more comfortable for him. In terms of doing that job, do you, do you get a lot out of being a spotter? Sure. Is it, is it a fun. kind of replacement for the competition you used to enjoy? Nothing. I, I, I realized five minutes after I, I made the decision I was going to retire, I already knew that there was nothing, nothing I could ever do to replace it, period. There was nothing that would give me the same feeling that I had driving the car because there's no feeling like sitting on the right rear and, and spotting. You, you, aren't, you don't have a right rear to get on, you know. And um, so, I, But it is a similar thing, and it is a similar satisfaction of feeling like you're helping, you know, if you can help. Uh, you know, help the team progress or go forward, uh, uh, be a part of helping them win a race or something like that. It's it's a very gratifying feeling, and and there's a lot of pressure on it too. It's it's uh, it's more than you realize. A lot of times, some of the tracks are very difficult to see with different angles, as far as you know, clearing them and, and that kind of thing. Um, and you don't want to make the wrong call, you know. So uh, there is some pressure involved with it, which. You know that's that's part of the satisfaction. You know, it's like qualifying here. The, you know, the that was a big part of the satisfaction is the pressure that you're under to do it. But um, so in that respect, you do get some of the you know some of the same thing. But it but nothing will ever replace sitting in the car. We've talked before about retirement and the fact that you quit at the end of '92. But there was you know bearing in mind that Mo won the race in '93. And then 
Al Junior won the race in 94, you could theoretically be a six-time <laughs> winner. <laughs> but there, there was only one instance where you thought it might be fun to get back in the car, and that was a test at Phoenix, correct? Yeah, test at Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it was gone right away. But uh, no, we, yeah, we just... We were going out there for a test, and um, Al Jr. was driving, and and we we pulled into the track, and they had just resurfaced the track, so he had brand new pavement, which is the highest grip level you'll ever have, and it was a cool, crisp morning, which the conditions were about as good as you'll ever get, and I remember thinking, boy, you could lay a lap down today, a lap time that would stand for a long time, and then not long after that, Al was running and exploded right rear tire and hit the fence and gearbox gearbox parts are raining down on top of us down pit lane and he's sliding down the front straight and i thought yep i made the right call (laughs) 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 it it, uh the the old thinking of getting in the car didn't last very long that at that and and when the push rod motor came out that was that was uh the only other semi tempting i mean it it would have been fun but it's still not enough to make me want to do it seriously i th- i think that's one of the uh, interesting things about you is that when you stopped you did not do what a lot of veterans uh, in the series including helio but also tk have talked about you know becoming an indy 500 specialist and coming back once once a year for you that was never an option though no i i've never agreed with that for me now it works for a lot of people and and, and each to their own but to me, if I'm going to be, which is why I got out, because as the de- desire started tapering off, I knew performance would be going with it. And this this sport is about improving. Every corner, every lap, every time you're in the car, is about how can I do it better than the time before. That's what this business is. And, uh, and if I'm not going to improve, why am I there? It's not fair to the team. It's not fair to the sponsors. Um, you you won't be competitive. Then it won't be any fun. And that's why I did it. It's because it was fun. So once the desire started tapering off, it was time to go. But the coming back to Indy once a year is, uh, for me to, to be at the top of my game, I have to run all the races between Indy to stay current. I mean, it's that's one reason I never got a pilot's license in an airplane because it's to me that was something you had to do every day and stay current, you know, and and uh, or or something will catch you out, and um, and that's the same way I felt about you know running one off once a year. Yeah, we could get in the car and we could have been semi competitive, but that's not why we did it. We weren't there to 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 be semi competitive. We we're there to try to win races and. And that's when I made the decision to retire. That was kind of one of the final days when I woke up one morning like, you idiot, you know. If you're thinking about retirement, you're past due. And, uh, you know, you aren't going to dig. You know, the hardest part of the decision was feeling like I was letting the team down because all four wins had been with the Penske organization, and, and I knew how much the team would like to have had that fifth win. And... Uh, and that was the biggest part of the struggle as far as making the decision to retire because I felt like I, re- I was letting them down. But then one morning I woke up and thought, you, you know, again, you idiot. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's time and you're thinking about retirement, you aren't going to dig deep enough to get the win anyway. You know, you aren't going to be competitive. You aren't going to get the job done. You probably won't get the fifth win even if you did keep going because once the desire tapers off, performance naturally goes with it and uh and i was just at that point it was time to go and and once i got out of the car the one reason i never did do anything else either first of all i got out because of desire so why would i want to do anything else and secondly i knew if i went and played anything else i'd like it too much and and it would try to suck me back into something else you know and and uh it's just you know we'd roll the dice a lot in our lifetime you know at that point to get to that point and uh, you know, don't need to roll up anymore. We should talk about an indie that didn't go so well, shouldn't we? When he caught fire in the pits. That was <laughs> exciting <Nigeria>. too. <laughs> yeah, for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> what do you remember of that that day? Basically, you know, all I know is that 
seeing that footage, it was the first time it hit me how terrifying it is to have to use a fuel that burns with an invisible flame. You basically couldn't see uh, who was on fire, and so the firemen, you know, don't know who to rescue first in terms of throwing water. Or, uh, I mean, I think it was your father that uh, yes. saved you from getting more burnt. Yes, yeah, it was Dad that ended up putting me out. You know, at, at the end of the day, yeah, it was just you know one of those things, and and uh, you know we'd had a, we'd had we'd had a problem in qualifying we lost a coil or something qualifying and, and so we had to jump the backup car and, and qualify the second day or whatever it was so we ended up starting back about 23rd or something like that and the qualifying speed and everything was very good and uh but because it was second day we had to start back uh, but the car was good in the race i mean we were going forward with it everything was going according to plan and Matter of fact, I think we'd, due to pit stops and things, I think we'd just taken the lead when we came into the pit. So we were, we were working our way back to where we needed to be. And um, it was the first stop, came in, made the stop, and our fueler went to plug in, and when he did, it jammed. And it wouldn't go in, so you know he, he pulled it out to, to try to reset it, and, and when he did, when he pulled it out to reset it, the nozzle was stuck open. And I'm sitting in the car, and all of a sudden I see a big splash of fuel hit the dash. I go, uh-oh. And about the time I saw that, a big sheet ran down over my helmet and into my, into my lap. And I thought, I'm in trouble. And about that time, it ignited. And so I, it seemed like it took minutes for my hand to get from the steering wheel to my, my seat belt. And as, my, as I was dropping my hand to grab the belt, I, I went to take a breath. And when I did, I felt the flames start down my throat. So fortunately, I quit breathing, but now I didn't have a breath. And, uh, but fortunately, I didn't burn my lungs. So now I don't have a breath, and I start struggling to get out of the car and using up what little oxygen I have, and I can't breathe. So I finally get unbuckled, and I, and I jump out of the car. The flames are coming up inside the helmet, and that's what ended up burning my nose and my eyes. And um, so I, I was trying to keep my eyes closed so it wouldn't burn my eyes, and I couldn't breathe. And I opened my eyes at one point, and I saw a crew member running toward me. And so I shut my eyes, and he, and he put his, I felt his hands underneath my helmet to try to get my helmet unbuckled. And then all of a sudden, they went away, and I opened my eyes, and he was running the other direction. I'd caught him on fire because he didn't know I was on fire when he ran up to me. All uh, right, right, right. And, uh, I mean, you know, if I'd have been thinking, which I don't do a lot of sometimes, what they teach you in school, lay down and roll, right? Right, right. <laughs> but I'd have probably rolled into the car instead of away from it. <laughs> but uh, so now I open my eyes and I'm, and I'm looking around to try to find somebody. And I look over and I see the fire marshal spray in the car. He's standing behind the wall spraying the car. And I'm thinking, over here. Yeah. <laughs> so I run around, around the car. And, and evidently, they'd kind of put the fire out a little bit over there on that side of the car where the fuel was on the ground. And I ran through the fuel and evidently reignited that as I ran through it. Oh, really? And Because oh. I think in the video, you can see it kind of go up again a little bit, the heat right. waves. So I ran up and I grabbed the, the end of the fire extinguisher and I stuck it under my helmet and shut my eyes again. And, and it quit. So I opened my eyes and the fire marshal was running the other way because I'd caught him on fire. So my dad, he was probably the only guy there that really understood and knew that I was actually on fire because he knows I don't move that fast for anything. <laughs> so he recognized it right away. And so he, he ran up and grabbed the fire extinguisher and pulled it up, and he stood back away from me, you know, and ended up putting it out. So finally I could breathe again. Now, now all of that really, I went back and watched the video afterward, and, and that whole time from the time it ignited to the time my dad ended up putting me out was only like 34 or 37 seconds something like that but when you don't have a breath to begin with and you don't know when you're going to get one and you're using up running around what what little you have it it seemed like 30 minutes but uh but it was it was an interesting day <laughs> <laughs> that's one way of putting it <laughs> yeah one thing I thought it was worth asking you about is obviously Fernando Alonso is coming from Formula One to IndyCar. Mm -hmm. You sort of did the same thing in reverse. You did have a little bit of a, uh, a flirtation with Formula One. You did two tests for Brabham mm -hmm. in 1980. 
I think one at Paul Ricard, one at Riverside. Riverside, yes. And there was at one stage a, a real possibility, a real option of of making that move. So perhaps you tell us about how close you really got there, what what you found when you tested the car. You were certainly quick, weren't you? Yeah, we ran we ran well, and and you know it was a combination of things. I mean, you know, Bernie Bernie and I we you know we actually came to terms, you know, dollars and all that kind of thing, and and, and really came to terms on on putting a deal together, and, and the money would have been good, uh, without a doubt. Um, but like I said, I got into this business for fun. I mean, I never dreamed of making a living at it. It was it was. You know, we worked during the week to make the means in my dad's small construction company to go play on the weekend, and it was family recreation and never dreamed of it turning into a living. Um, it was all done because I loved to drive things, and um, and it just progressed. So, you know, when that opportunity came about, there was a combination of things that were going on. It was back when uh, the, you know, USAC cart split was taking place, Um Timing wise, at that point when when they first contacted me about doing the test, it was still kind of in the air whether cart was going to go or not, no go, you know, go or not go. And uh, so to me, I looked at it a couple different ways. First of all, it was it was an opportunity to to kind of get my foot in the door in case, you know, something didn't go. Uh, secondly, it was an opportunity to, for me to satisfy my curiosity that if I'd never gotten the opportunity to drive the car, it always would have been in the back of my mind, could we have driven one of those, you know? And uh, do they put their pants on one leg at a time like I do or, or, or not, you know? And, and, and I'd been finding all along through my career that every time we had made a move or made a change to another form of racing, every time I did it, it was the same kind of thing. Yep, it's a race car. They put their pants on just like I do. Now, some don't think they do, but they actually do. And, um, you know, so, but still, until you do it, you, you, you're you always going to wonder about it. So I got the opportunity, and we went over there and, and to do the test. And uh, and, it, and it Ricard, we ran here, I forget what we got. We got to within a half a second or, you know, three quarters of a second or whatever it was of Nelson, who I would have been teamed with at the time had, had we have done it. And it was the right time, right team. They won the championship the next year. Um, so we did the test, and I knew. Uh, you know, I mean, the way I ran the car there, I made. I was making sure there were no mistakes. There was not going to be a mistake. So I, I was, you know, obviously keeping a little up my sleeve, and I knew that just with time, just seat time alone, there was more to come. So that that showed me then, satisfied my own curiosity and my own ego, that I felt we could be competitive if, if we decided to do it. And um, so then, you know, we hadn't come to a decision on anything yet, made the decision, and and then sometime later, and it's like months, whatever it was, before we went to Riverside, we did the next test at Riverside on a track I knew, and except we put chicanes up because we were doing a Wiseman gearbox test, and they wanted to get it up and down through the gears, so the track wasn't exactly the way I knew it. But we ended up being you know, a couple seconds quicker than Nelson was there. So I got to satisfy my own curiosity. I didn't have to do it. I wasn't doing it for everybody else. I was doing it for me. And uh, I thought, okay, we could do this if we want to. So now the final decision boiled down to where am I, where am I going to have the most fun? That's why I do this. By then we could see cart taking off, you know, that it, that it was, it was going to go. And, and I really enjoyed the Penske organization. Uh, I wasn't ready to leave that. And I enjoyed running Everything, speedways, short ovals, permanent circuits, street circuits. In this series, I got to do all of it, and that's why I did this. So really, that's what it boiled down to. Where am I going to have the most fun? And um, we just made the decision. Once I got to drive the car and say, yep, it's a race car, all you do is you listen to it just like you do all the others and do what it tells you it wants to do. And, you know, yeah, it was 
it was, you know, you'd break much deeper, uh, you know, much more tire, much lighter weight. Uh, the first time I went into turn one at speed and decided, okay, now I'm going to run it in once I got warmed up. I went in there and stood on the brakes and started dropping gears, and pretty soon I had to drop another gear and pick the throttle up to get to the corner. It stopped so quick compared to our cars. So, okay, you just move your shift, you know, move your braking points. That's a, you're still trying to achieve the same thing, get it in as deep as you can, get through the middle of the corner as fast as you can, and off the corner as fast as you can. And so you just adjust accordingly to what the car wants. And, um, and, and pretty soon, you know, the numbers start, start coming along once, once I learned what the car wanted and, and figured out how to do it. But uh, so I thought, okay, we, I felt we could be competitive if we, if we decided to go that way. Where am I going to have the most fun? That was the bottom line. So I decided to stay where I was at. Probably a good decision. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Judging to, by what happened. To be honest, after. I have no regrets, none whatsoever, the, 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 the decision we made. And I guess as a final point before we let you get on, because obviously we're talking in a, in a rain delay here at Indy, and the, the track is getting drier, so I imagine you might have some work to do in a minute. So Not much I, could, I could listen to you all day. But I, I, <laughs> um, uh, I'm good right now. But in terms of what, Fernando yeah, Alonso. Your phone on. <laughs> just yeah, in case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see Helio driving past just looking lost. <laughs> Going the wrong way. <laughs> um, You're clear. Clear. <laughs> uh, just talking in general about IndyCar, the Indy 500, obviously all the interest from Alonso. Is it good to see that level of interest and just the feeling that this is on the up? Because obviously it's oh. had some tough times, this form of racing in the US over the past 20 years, but and it's not just Alonso, it's the whole thing. Fantastic teams, fantastic drivers. There seems to be a real feel that this is this is on the on the upward curve and there's yes. quite a long way up yet to go. Yes. No, I absolutely I agree. And, and and like this, you know, with Alonso, that's just another step, uh, another thing that helps and and uh you know, that's the kind of thing we need. Um it's you know, and, and it's been on an upswing. I, I know like up there spotting for Elio in turn three. You know, especially here at Indy, you you get to um, you get a good overview of the whole place. You know, on race day, and and it over the past five six years, it's been nothing but steady growth. You know, in the infield as far as numbers go and people and 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 enthusiasm and 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 all along. I mean, every year, you know, the seats would get filled up fairly soon, but. You know, five, six years ago, the the banks around the infield were a little more sparse, you know, as far as people were concerned. And uh, and and it just it just kept filling in more and more every year. And and even the year before last, uh, before the 100th anniversary, it was actually pretty full in the infield. And then the 100th anniversary race, obviously, was just packed. I mean, it was just it was tremendous. But it's been on a steady upswing. And. And I think now, you know, the you know the the changes that have been made in IndyCar with personnel, people, and everything else, I think they're on the right track. And you know, this business is like anything else. It's you know, yes, there's tradition. Yes, you've got to keep certain things, and yes, you want to keep a lot of different things. But there are some things you just have to change. You know, there's no two ways of looking at it. And you know, obviously, one of the things is it's like when you know making the decision to shorten up the month here. Uh, you know, there were so many against it and, and so many for it. And, you know, with technology and, and Internet and, you know, live streaming and everything else, you know, there weren't as many people coming out during practice, you know, for the full month of May. And this place is so big, you could have 30,000 people in here and, and it looks empty. You know, 50,000 people and it looks empty. Shortening it up and compressing the amount of people that you get over the month into a shorter period of time, it just helps build because it, it's more shoulder to shoulder, more enthusiasm, more uh, visually it looks stronger, you know, and everything else. And I think that's been part of the learning how to utilize, you know, the, the electronic media today. And, and, and just like I always kind of liken it to same way with us as a team when we first started measuring the cars and collecting data on cars. Yeah, I remember the first time we f first started measuring things on cars and collecting data, we had three channels. I think one was steering, one was throttle, and speed, you know, and, and um, maybe four. It's like, wow, look at this. Look what we get to look at. You know, you know we, can, we can graph this out and see where the throttle's at, the position and steering angle and speed and brake, all this. 
you know, that's really cool. Oh, wait a minute. Now, how do we use this? You know, now, how do we apply this, this knowledge that we're getting from this the, the right way or the best way? Because others are going to start collecting it all. So how do we, how do we apply what we're you know, gathering here in the most efficient way to get use of it and to utilize it better than they do? Well, that's the way this, this business is. You know, as the, the younger age and electronics and the media comes into play and more and more outlets. And, you know, you got to learn how to, to integrate that into the sport and, and, and utilize it to the best of your ability. And I think that's where IndyCar has been making good progress, you know. And, um, you know, Verizon, our sponsors coming in the, in that area, in that industry to help, you know, figure and learn ways of helping us as partners utilize all of that. I think all of that has been coming together, and that's what we're seeing in the growth. You know, that's one part of it. But I think that's going to continue on. It's a never-ending curve. It's just like driving a car. You try to improve every corner, every lap. Well, every race, you try to improve it. You sit down, you analyze everything after the race, after the event. Okay, how can we make it better next year? And uh, you do the same thing with the series. You do the same thing, you know, across the board. And um, and I think some of the changes that have been made, I think I think we're heading in the right direction with uh, the rules on the cars. Um, I've never been a... a, a a huge fan of downforce. I've always kind of wanted to go the other way in aerodynamics um, since I was driving. And let me do the job, not the car. Let you know, give me more tools to work with. And as you apply more driver aids, whether it's back in the early electronic days and traction control and or ABS braking, even paddle shifting, that kind of thing, to me, every one of those were a lost tool for me. You know, now it's down to my computer guy tuning that better than his computer guy rather than my right foot being the tuner. And um, so to me, I think those are areas we can still work in and work on. And I think the the new group is, is uh, understanding that more today. I think, you know, we need to, you know, as far as safety goes, take a look at, you know, we're always trying to build a softer wall, a stronger chassis. Um, safety is always number one and and it, that's been the biggest gain in in growth since I've been in the car is in safety and they're as safe now as they've ever been in the history of sport which doesn't mean things can't still happen but you always strive to make that better well to me the next major step in in safety is is corner speeds and reducing corner speed and and let us run down the straightaway more it accomplishes several things to me. It accomplishes putting me back in charge a little bit more of my, my own de- controlling my own destiny. Um, I have more input uh, if I have to throttle back a little bit more for the corner. Plus, if I do make a mistake, it's not going to be as big, and I'm not going to hit as hard. It's all about lateral load. The higher the lateral load, it, it all works together. The higher the lateral load goes up in the corner, the harder you're going to hit whatever you hit. And uh, so I think that's going to be the next step. Uh, and I think everybody's kind of on that track, but it's not something that's done easily overnight. Uh, it's going to take some time to get there. And I, and I think, you know, uh, the team is working on that uh, as we speak. I think the next generation cars coming out are going to be leaning more toward that direction. And I think really, you know, to me and, and – we were talking about it here a while back, and, and it's almost a way – you always have to have something to kind of sell it, you know, to kind of – a direction like that, especially a, a change. And to me, it's like, okay, we've, we've done technology. We've done this. We've done that. You know, Formula One is all about the technology. They've got a handle on that. We don't have to do it because they do, in, in my mind. We've got a totally different series. We, we've got totally different racetracks. Why not we take a look at making it more of an, inf- you know, put more emphasis on a driver series. You know, more of, this is a, a, a driver series. And to do that, the more I have to move that right foot, the more input I have. And and I think I think people are starting to look that direction a little bit more today. And, and, uh, and I think it's going to be a, a, it's going to be difficult to do. And, and, you know, it, it, you know, 
it's hard for me as a driver. I know which hat I have on and, and which way I'd like to see it go. And But, you know, you put the promoter's hat on, the sponsor's hat, the, the, the series hat, you know, it, it, it means different things in different areas. So how do we get all that to work together? The, the engine, you know, company's hat, uh, how do we – how do we start making the adjustments and make it a, a win-win for everybody? That's the difficult part. And that's the part that's going to take some time, so you can't get in a rush. Uh, I know us as competitors, we want it to happen overnight, but those things don't happen. So we just got to keep our keep our head down and keep working forward and, and, and hopefully making right decisions. And, and I think this, this sport's going to just continue to go forward. I think one of the big help there is going to be uh, the universal error kit because it means that if they need to make radical decisions overnight, you don't have any more political bullshit between the manufacturers. The series can say, hey, this is what you do. Mm-hmm. End of story. Uh, and I think that's just going to be a, a big help, especially when they're trying to make uh, Phoenix more racy and Iowa and you know make a change whereby the terminal speed on the straight is a hell of a lot higher than the apex speed I mean, yeah we've talked about this well it's you know it, 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 it's a difficult call to make because you know one of the things i think over the years people it, it makes it tough to do is because you know once you create pack racing for the fan and for the media and for everybody if all of a sudden you have one or two cars at the finish line instead of a pack it's a whole home race so you've already kind of created that monster you know and and um, and I think you know over the years one of the reasons it's it's been a difficult decision to make is because if you look back at the early years when you had the runaways you know somebody win the race by a lap or two laps or whatever like yourself at Indy in eighty four exactly yeah and you're afraid of that happening again you know but but I think one of the equations that they forget to figure in is back then we had we had a lot of different chassis and chassis types, manufacturers, uh, or some years even tire manufacturers, you know, more than one, several different engine manufacturers, and then different combinations of all the above. Plus, you know, you had, you know, two, three, four teams, you know, that were at the top of the heap, so to speak. So the odds of getting that runaway were much greater. Today, in today's formula, you know, with running the same car, even though we've got two different engine manufacturers, they're, they're so close. And everybody's got the same chassis, same package, especially if the aero kits even kind of come back into the same. We've all got the same blocks to play with. It's probably as, as reasonable to get into this series right now, dollar-wise, than it's ever been in the history of the world, in the history of the sport. Um, you're all playing with the same blocks, when you get there, you, you know, you get a few key people in place, get the same blocks everybody is, has, and now it's a matter of how you stack the blocks and who can stack them in the best way. But you've got the blocks. It's just a matter of stacking them. So if you make a huge change, you're not going to see the runaway that we used to have, I don't think. Will it separate them some? Yes, it will, possibly, especially in the early races. But... You give it enough time to play out, everybody's playing with the same blocks, eventually they all start learning how to stack them the same way, and it closes back up. So I don't think you would ever, with today's rules, whatever rules you end up with with today's package, see the kind of runaway that that, that we used to have that a lot of people are afraid we might have if we make too big a change. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone's scared of someone coming in with a Chaparral 2K and just demolishing the field. Sure. Sure, uh, and, which is understandable. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But I it's mean, the kind of thing that doesn't happen so much anymore because, as you're saying, Rick, the the knowledge base is so right. high that the, those gaps. It's very different, difficult to have those step changes, isn't it? Where yeah. you blow people out of the water. It's it's more right. incremental, isn't it? There, I tell you, there, there's a you know the depth of of competitive teams and drivers and everything that we have today is as deep as it's ever been in the history of the sport. You know, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, you know, so I think. I think we're at a stage where you could you could you could you could just about make you know any call you wanted to make and and you would still have some good good competitive races. Well, we've just heard in the background that the green flag is about ten minutes away, <laughs> so so I think probably much as we'd like to keep you here for another yeah. oh, what, ten Rick or twelve needs hours. To make his way down to turn three. Is it? 
that you spoke from? Uh, for this, the rest of the session, I'll probably just go down pit lane and work between the guys and just see, you know, okay. and then and we've got some other guys up there that are, that are spotting right now. And, right. Uh, some of these sessions, I like to hang out in the pit lane and just kind of float back and forth between the teams and kind of see what's going on and see if there's anything I can, anything I can help with. Yep. Rebuilding yeah. Joseph's con- confidence. Yeah, no, he's he's going to be fine, and and that's you know we talked about it last night and this morning. It's just you, you know basically all you do is you you know we've been there, done that. You just get back in the car, and it's it's getting on the bicycle, and uh, you know yeah, you you always have a little in the back of your mind, but as soon as you get out there and you get running, and that's what we said. Hey, take your time. There's no rush. You know, don't do anything you're not comfortable with. Sneak up on it. Small steps, and and pretty soon you're right back where you need to be. So he's he's going to be fine. Well, I can honestly say it's been fascinating and a real privilege oh, to be able to listen much. to you. And I'm sure the listeners uh, to this podcast will be thrilled to have heard the stories and and get a feel for the the approach and the mindset and the the kind of intelligence that you brought to to this race so many times <laughs> no one better well i don't know about that the, the, the thing that always helped me out in cars is you don't have time to think that way <laughs> that way i can't get in the way of it <laughs> <laughs> well that's one way of looking at it but uh, i think there was plenty of thinking going on uh, even, uh, if it, even if it's all down in the subconscious isn't it that's, well, that, that's where the important stuff that happen. but the, <laughs> the, the big thing to me is always you know we we, we were so fortunate early on in the career to get hooked up with the right people and have the right tools to be able to put the numbers on the board that we did and that's all due to the whole team and everybody you know having the whole package that's that's one of the main things that's what it's all about well thanks very much for joining me thank Rick you Mears. thanks also to david Malsha uh, no for, for joining pleasure. us um obviously there'll be huge amounts of coverage of the indy 500 on autosport.com and motorsport.com as well autosport magazine out every thursday and we'll have hopefully a little bit more podcast content down the line so thanks very much for listening We'll be back soon with another Also Sport podcast. Music is 6am by Trilo, written by Marcus Simmons. See soundcloud.com forward slash Trilo Music. Mm-hmm.